Well, good morning, everyone. So good to welcome you all here today. Um, we are in the middle of summer. A lot of our people are away on vacation right now. Queer people. But anyways, um, we're so delighted to have you here this morning with us. And um, this morning, we're going to welcome as a guest speaker in the absence of our pastor who's still on vacation this week, um, Pastor Bob Parks. And for those who are newer at our church, you may not know him, but he interimed at our church when we were without a pastor before Pastor Steve came. And so those of us who have been here during that time, really learned to appreciate his guidance and leadership and his ministry. Um, always enjoy listening to him share the word of God with us. And so we look forward to that today. Pastor um, Bob has been a, a pastor for many, many years. He pastored at Benton Street Baptist Church for quite a number of years. He's been very involved at uh, Heritage Bible College. And um, I think he's pretty much semi-retired semi now, but he's not retired today. So uh, welcome, Pastor Bob. You. I appreciate uh, that warm introduction and uh, good morning everyone. For those of you I haven't met yet, uh, I hope I have a chance maybe after the service to have a personal word with you and introduce myself to you and you to me. My wife Judy is not with me today. She sends her regrets but uh, is not feeling that well and uh, would love to have been here to see some of you that we've known in the past. So it's good to be here, and thank you to Pastor Steve for his gracious invitation to come and speak here at Northside today. I'm glad you didn't let any, anything keep you from coming to the service this morning, not the threat of rain, and not uh, you know other things that you might be likely to do. You chose to be here, so that's why you're here today, and that, that's a good thing. I remember hearing of a fellow that uh, missed a few Sundays that he was away from his church and he ran into his pastor in the grocery store. And wouldn't you know it, and the pastor said, oh, brother, I missed you these last few weeks. He uh, said, where have you been? He said, well, there have been a couple things that have gone on. He said, well, would you mind sharing them with me? He was being a little pressuring him a bit. And he said, well, for one thing, it's it's been raining the last couple of weeks. and." And uh, the pastor said, well, it's, it's dry in church. And the fellow said, well, that's another reason. So uh, <laughs> maybe that's not your issue, I hope not. And we wouldn't want it to be the case this morning, but uh, it's good to be here together and to fellowship in, in the Lord. Um, some, some time ago, not that long ago, I was looking through Kindle uh, offerings. Some of you may be like me, Kindle readers. You, you, have your, you have copies of books, but you also have uh, the Kindle edition. Any, any Kindle users here today? Oh, just one or two people from the same family. <laughs> well, uh, it's, it's one way of uh, you know, having books along with you. You can have a whole collection of them and uh, carry it with you on vacation or wherever, and it's right there, and you turn the pages electronically. Anyway, this was the title that I, uh, um, that I came across, which really was kind of surprising to me, and it caught my attention right away. The title of the book uh, had to do with uh, a farewell to Jesus or a goodbye to Jesus, and it was written by a pastor by the name of Tim Sledge. Tim Sledge was a pastor in the South Southern Baptist Convention for about 35 years. He was well known in his circles. He pastored several good-sized churches. He established a, a Christian recovery ministry that uh, really spread across, especially the southern U.S., 20,000 groups for recovery groups uh, because of his initiation. And after all that time, all those years of ministry, he decided that he was going to walk away from not only his pastoral work, but also from his faith. He said he was disillusioned, the things that he expected to have happen didn't happen, and because of that he said, uh, I no longer believe. And so he did, he walked away from his faith. That was kind of surprising to me, and it uh, raised some old questions in my own mind. It reminded me of another book that I had become familiar with uh, several years before, back in the 90s, and it was written by a fellow by the name of Charles Templeton. You may recognize that name. Charles Templeton was Canadian, but he was also involved in the U.S. in evangelism for many years. He was a, 
He was a fellow evangelist along with Billy Graham in the Billy Graham's earliest days. And they together were instrumental along with a few other people in establishing Youth for Christ, which for a long, long time was a very vibrant ministry to teens and young people in the US and across the world. Charles Templeton came back to Canada and became a journalist and uh, a broadcaster. But he wrote this book called Farewell to God, very much like Tim Sledge's book, Goodbye Jesus. And in his book, Charles Templeton basically explained why he walked away from his faith, what it was that led him away from believing in Jesus, preaching the gospel as he had for years and years, seeing many people come to faith in Christ because of his ministry. You know, you combine those things together and you think, wait a minute, uh, what's, what's happening in this situation? It leads me to think about the fact and to ask myself the question, could that ever possibly be me? It, you might ask yourself that question this morning. Could, could I ever possibly be one of those who would walk away from my faith in Jesus? Well, you might have an immediate response. Well, absolutely not. There's no way that I could ever do that. There's no way I would ever entertain that thought. But for these men, they probably felt that way at the early part of their lives, but they ended up actually walking away from their faith in Jesus. It reminded me of a passage in John, the Gospel of John, and I'd like you to turn to that passage. If you brought your Bible along with you today, you can follow there, and we may have the scripture uh, to follow on the screen as well. But it reminded me of the question that Jesus asked his disciples, which was very much along the same line, about would you want to walk away from your following Jesus? In John chapter six of John's Gospel, uh, we can kind of come in on the story in verse 35 where Jesus was talking to uh, a crowd of people and he said these words, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never hunger and whoever believes in me will never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me and yet you not, do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. Jesus was talking to these people, explaining to them a truth, using a metaphor, and here's what he said when he said, the bread of life, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never hunger or thirst. He said in verse 38, for I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me, and this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given to me, but raise it up at the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. He's talking about the gift of eternal life using this metaphor of the bread of life, which he says he is the bread of life. Now in verse 41, it says, the Jews grumbled about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. And they said, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph? whose father and mother we know, how does he now say, I've come down from heaven? Jesus answered them, do not grumble among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. It is written in the prophets that they will all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the father except he is from God. He has seen the father. Truly, truly, I say to you, Whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate manna in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the bread of life that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. Then the Jews disputed among themselves saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food and my blood is true drink. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. As the living Father sent me, 
and I live because of the Father. So whoever feeds on me, he will also live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not the bread the fathers ate and died. Whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. And it says that Jesus said these things in the synagogue as he taught at Capernaum. But now here's what came as a result of that encounter and Jesus teaching. When many of his disciples heard it, they said, this is a hard saying, who can listen to it? But Jesus knowing in himself that his disciples were grumbling about this said to them, do you take offense at this? Then what if you were to see the son of man ascending to where he was before? It is the spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. But there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning those who would, would not believe and who it was that would betray him. And he said, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless the Father is granted to him by the Father. After this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. So Jesus said to the 12, do you want to go away as well? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, and we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Jesus answered them, did I not choose you, the 12, and yet one of you is a devil? He spoke of Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, for he is one of the 12 who is going to betray him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Here was the situation. Jesus was teaching, calling himself metaphorically the bread of life, telling to the people that they needed to take, them, take him into their lives, believe on him, trust in him, and assimilate him in their, in their whole person, just like you would if you were to eat something or drink something to actually believe so that you become a part of what you are believing. And of course, the belief, the, the object of their belief would be Jesus himself. And this was something that was hard for those Jewish people to accept. Number one, as it said, it was hard for them expect, to accept the fact that Jesus said, I came down from heaven. They said, we know where you came from. We know your parents, we know where you were raised and what city, how can you say you came down from heaven? was bothersome to them. And then when he said, you need to eat my, eat my body and my flesh and my blood, that was, that was something that would be abhorrent to an average Jew because they, they were trained from their very earliest days. You don't eat anything with blood in it. Your meat has to be drained of the blood, the kosher food, because the life of the flesh is in the blood. So you need to stay away from it. And Jesus is saying, no, you need to eat it. And you need to take it into yourself. And they said, we can't handle that. So the things that Jesus was saying to them were hard sayings and they said, we can't, we can't follow that anymore. So some of them turned around and walked away. It was hard for them to accept that. You know, there are people that walk away from Jesus even now, people that have hard situations in their life. Maybe it's not just the teachings of Jesus that are hard for them to accept and to continue in. It may be hard situations losses in their life, people that they loved, that they prayed for and asked God to do something and, and keep them from dying, and they died anyway. Other situations where people have betrayed one another and, and, and gone against one another, answered unanswered prayers, any host of a number of things have caused many people in their course of their, their life to actually turn away from the faith that they said they once held in Jesus. So the question often is, well, could that be me? Or could it be you? That's a serious question. We ought, to, we ought to think along those lines because there are people that obviously we have known about. There are people that I know personally who have, I felt at one point in their life, made a true confession of faith, but they turned away from it for one reason or another. What was Jesus talking about when he was referring to the bread of life. What was that all about? Well, it obviously was a metaphor for eternal life. Eternal life, by the way, is not just dying and going to heaven. That's what some people think of when they think of eternal life. That's when it begins. When you die, eternal life kicks in and then it's eternal life from that time forward. But 
Eternal life is not really dying and going to heaven. Eternal life is the life of God. Eternal life is resident in a person. Jesus himself calls himself the bread of life, which means that he is himself eternal life. You remember when Jesus said in John 14, in a few chapters beyond this chapter, he said to his disciples, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And he was saying by that, that there is no life apart from him. He says it more clearly by way of example in John 15, when he talked about the vine and the branches. He said, I am the vine, you're the branches. If you abide in me, if you live in me, and I live in you, you will, per you will produce fruit. Fruit is the evidence of life in a person. So connection with Jesus is the connection to life. If you aren't connected to Jesus, you aren't connected to life, eternal life, in fact, is Jesus himself. And when we think about eternal life and having Jesus in our life, we think about a relationship to him. It is that kind of intimacy that Jesus was talking about when he talked about eating his flesh and drinking his blood, taking him in so, so intimately to your life that he becomes a part of who you are. How do you get eternal life? Well, Jesus said it so clearly. If you look back in verse 47, we read it just a moment ago. He said, truly I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. That's the way that we access eternal life. We believe in Jesus. We take him at his word. We understand who he is. We believe that he is the son of God came down here to earth. We believe that he is the one that God appointed to be the, the lamb of God to take away the sin of the world. We believe all of that, not just in our minds, but we believe it with our whole person and we enter into faith in him and we believe and receive the gift of eternal life. So it's like feeding on him as the bread of life. How do you know that you have eternal life? Well, there is assurance, isn't there, for eternal life? One of the assurances I'm holding in my hand, you're probably holding in your hand your Bible. And in this record of scripture, we have the promises of God that we relate to eternal life. Jesus said that if anyone would believe on him, you will have eternal life. So you take Jesus, you take God at his word, and you receive the gift of eternal life by faith, and you believe that you have it because Jesus promised that you would. You also, if you are a true believer in Jesus, you have the evidence of his life in you because God puts the spirit of himself in our hearts so that that spirit, his life in us, witnesses to our own spirit that we are children of God. It's like a confirmation inside of us that we actually belong to him and have the gift of eternal life. But you know, we often ask the question, I have myself, how do I know that my faith in Jesus is real? Some of you may be like me. I, I became a believer in Christ when I was very young. My mother, who became a Christian after she and my dad had gotten married, became a, a, a real strong Christian and she wanted all of her children to go with her to church and Sunday school and to hear the gospel and she prayed with many of us, myself included, to receive Jesus as savior. I did that when I was young, probably around the age of seven. But for many years, I uh, questioned myself and said, you know, I was so young when I actually trusted Jesus. I wonder if that really was sincere. I wonder if it really took. Have you ever had that? Question in your mind, did it, did it really stick? Because I was so young, did I understand it? Was it really a genuine conversion? So I remember several times during the course of my childhood and into my teens, I would say, well, maybe what I better do is pray again. And if I pray again and ask Jesus to, be, to come into my life, then I'll know for sure that this was the occasion when I would pray and receive him. And I would write that date down in my Bible and say it was on this day that I prayed again to receive Jesus. But then a few years later, I began to question in my mind, well, was that, was that a real sincere conversion? So I'll try it again. And I remember doing that so many different times during those early years, thinking that I wanted to be sure that at least one of those occasions was the time that it really connected and it came true. Well, you know what I found as I grew later on? that the test of true faith is not whether I was sincere back then and whether it, whether it took at that moment. The test of true faith is where my heart is right now.
at this very moment. If I look inside my heart and I see and question myself, do I really believe in Jesus, that he is the son of God, that he paid the penalty for my sin, that if I would believe in him, I could have eternal life? Is that the condition of my heart? And the, if the answer is yes, then you know that there is true faith within you because true faith is not just a past event. True faith is a present reality. If you're truly born again, if you truly know Jesus as Savior, you should be able to look in your heart right now and see whether or not your faith in Jesus is a real faith, is a true faith, because you take him at his word and you believe in him and follow him. It's not a matter of whether you were necessarily sincere and tried as hard to believe as you could possibly believe, but it's a matter of whether or not you have actually placed your faith in him as he said you should do and allowed him to come into your life. True faith is more than just a point in time experience. I wonder if you've ever thought of that. True faith is more than just a point in time experience. I've known a lot of people who place their faith in Jesus, or at least they thought they did, at, at an earlier point in their life, maybe when they were seven or 10 or 15 or something. And then at some point in their life, there was no real reality of continuing on in the faith. And if you look at their lives today, you would say there's no true evidence of whether or not they actually came to Jesus at all. Because the evidence of their life at the present time doesn't, sh doesn't show any faith in Jesus at all. In fact, in some cases, they turn so completely away that they are anti-Jesus and they react against their upbringing and things of their past. The test is really a test of faith in the present. And that's why we understand that a relationship to Jesus Christ is not just a one-time event back in history sometime. It is a relationship that continues on and goes forward in our life because we have a continuing relationship and faith in Jesus. I brought with me today two documents that, that I keep in my safe deposit box. One of them is an insurance policy. <laughs> I've had that in there for quite a long time. I took it out when I was a young fellow, just newly married, and figured, you know, if anything happened to me, I would want my family to be taken care of. Isn't that why we have insurance? So that we would be able to see that our family is, is taken care of. This insurance policy takes effect when I die. It's, it's in, in effect right now, but really it kicks in when I die. That's what a lot of people think of when they think of salvation. Well, make sure that you take out that policy because you want to be sure that you're going to go to heaven. You hear people talking about gospel messages and so on and saying, if you want to go to heaven when you die, then trust in Jesus. Okay, sign me up. I want to go. I heard about one young man who was in the service and the pastor was saying, uh, how many of you want to go to heaven? Stand up. And so many people in the congregation stood up, but that little boy didn't. And the pastor said, called him by name and said, son, don't you want to go to heaven? And he said, well, yes, pastor, I do, but I thought you were getting up a load for tonight. <laughs> and I wasn't sure I was ready for that. Well, it's not a matter of just the, the insurance that will kick in at the time of your death. Salvation certainly includes that because it includes, as Jesus said, being raised up at the last day. That's, that's a final expression of salvation. But the other document that I brought along with me today is this. It's my marriage license. Judy and I were married when we were in our 40s. We had both been widowed. Uh, our previous mates passed away from cancer, and we met each other and uh, fell in love. We're married, combined our families. We have seven kids and 28 grandkids now, we're just trying to collect the whole set of them if we can. But uh, this was our marriage license on the day that we said, I do. We signed it, we agreed to it, we stood before a pastor and said, I take you to be my wedded husband, my wedded wife. To have and to old from this day forward, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, forsaking all others, cleaving to you alone, and." as long as we both shall live. We made those promises and we signed this document that says we are married. 
Our wedding took place on this particular date that is listed here, but the marriage itself is an ongoing thing. <laughs> there was a beginning when we got married, but our marriage actually is a long-term commitment to one another. That's how we know that, that our marriage is real, is because we live it out every single day of our lives. You see, that's, our faith in Jesus is more like this marriage license than it is this insurance policy. It includes both, but it is more, practically speaking, more like the marriage license because our relationship to Jesus is every day that we live. My faith in Jesus is just not something that I confirmed in the past that I don't have any relationship to or any connection with in the present. No, it's, it's an ongoing relationship. And I live my life every day in relationship to Jesus, just like I live my life in relationship to my wife, because we have committed ourselves to one another. And every day we wanna to walk together in a living relationship. Faith in Jesus is not a one-time event. It is a lifetime of walking with him and growing in intimacy with him. So there's the question. Could I possibly walk away? Hmm. Well, you say, well, you know, if it's marriage you're talking about, yes, people do walk away. People do say, I don't want to be married to you anymore. I, I've had too many problems. We've gone through too many hard times. So I don't want to take this. I, I just want to walk away from it. And people do walk away from their marriage relationship. And it's possible at that level to do that. But is it possible to do that with your faith? Well, in one sense, it's a theological question. The theological question, is it ever possible to walk away from Jesus if you've come to know him? Now, there's a lot of evidence in that very passage that we read that Jesus said, whoever comes to me is, is the Father has given to me and he will, I will lose nothing of it. <laughs> Jesus said, if you will come to me, that I will keep you safe and I will raise you up at the last day. So we have many promises in the scripture that assure us that we are secure and safe when we place our faith in Jesus because he commits himself to us just as we commit ourselves to him. But then there is that question about many of the scriptures that warn against walking away. You read several of them in the book of Hebrews where the Hebrew says that, you know, if you've once tasted of a heavenly gift and you walk away from it, there's no, there's no coming back to it. Well, some say, well, that's talking about Jewish people who kind of came up to the door but actually never entered into it. But Paul talked about people that he said they had come to the end of their life, like Hymenaeus and, and uh, the, another gentleman whose name escapes me. He said... Uh, they have made shipwreck of their faith because they have turned aside. He even said, some will in the latter time turn away from their faith, giving heed to deceptive spirits. So Paul warned against this whole idea of turning away. And there are warnings in scripture that say that we need to continue in the faith because that's the security, that's the assurance that we have. The whole book of 1 John is written with this thought in mind that you may know that you have eternal life. If you have Jesus in your life, you may know that. As, as he writes in 1 John 5, he says, this is the record God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. If you have the Son of God, you have life. If you don't have the Son of God, you don't have life. So we believe and hold on to that as a, as a theological conviction that we are secure in him. And I would say amen to that. We are secure in Jesus Christ. But we also know that there are those who have, have professed their faith in Christ and they have spoken of their desire to serve him and walk with him who have turned aside. So there are some people who would believe, yes, I, I think it is possible to defect, defect from the faith. It's possible to walk away. When you face those hard times and losses and you say, I'm not doing this anymore and I'm not believing anymore, so they make as, as firm a decision to walk away as they did to actually come to Jesus. Well, as I said, that's a theological question. And quite frankly, there are people who are, I, I believe are solid theologically in many, other, in many respects who have differences of opinion about 
whether you could ever lose your faith or whether you could never lose your faith. I happen to fall on one side of that line and maybe you do as well. But nevertheless, there is that question and that, that warning about not walking away from the faith. So what do you do with that? Remember Peter's response to Jesus when Jesus asked that question. Do you want to go away as well? We saw it in verse 66 and 7. And Simon Peter answered him and said, Lord, to whom shall we go? Only you have the words of eternal life. And we have believed that and come to know that you are the Holy One of God. So really in response to that question, could I walk away? My heart wants to respond this way. Why would I ever want to walk away? If, if, even if it were possible for me to walk away, why would I want to do that? Because if I walked away from Jesus, I would be walking away from life. I would be walking into the darkness, back into the darkness that was there before I even knew that there was anything like trusting in him for eternal life. And like Peter, why would I ever want to do that? Why would I want to turn away and walk away from Jesus? I know, you know, there are times in my life, and you're probably thinking about times in your life as well, when your faith in him has grown pretty weak. Can you think of times of that? Times when you were saying, uh, you know, I, I'm, tr I'm struggling to believe, I'm struggling to, to have faith in Jesus, and I'm not sure that, that I can really hold on. Well, I think during those moments, the assurance that comes to our hearts is this. It's not all dependent upon your grip on him. It's dependent upon his grip on you. If I didn't know that Jesus Christ had his hand firmly gripping in mine, I might be likely to say, I just, I can't do this anymore. These struggles, these, these temptations, these issues of life are such that I, I just don't think I can handle that. So I'm not gonna try to do it. But if we have our hand in his, in his hand, firmly gripping our lives, then we know that we are secure in him. So why would we want to wait, walk away from Jesus when he, his desire is to hold on to our hands? And uh, even this picture, as you can see, uh, if you pull that up on the screen, about hold, his holding our hands. Our grip is so weak and so frail, but the grip of Jesus is strong. I don't know if you sung that contemporary song, he will hold me fast, he will hold me fast, for my Savior loves me so, he will hold me fast. That's a, a beautiful song to sing. But you know, there's another song that we could sing right alongside of that. It's a song that Brian Dirksen wrote. It says, today I choose to follow you. Today I choose to give my yes to you. You see, it's a both and kind of a situation. Jesus said, if you will abide in me, I will abide in you. If you'll make your home in me, I'll make my home in you. If you will believe in me and trust in me and reach out to me, I will reach to you and hold you in my grip. So we do have a response. It's not a work. We don't work for our salvation, but our response is this response of faith. And like Jesus said in verse 47, those who believe will have eternal life. So do you believe in him today? Quiz yourself, what is the condition of your heart at this very moment? Are you trusting in him and him alone for your salvation? Is your faith in him deeply strong and rooted in him and saying, Lord Jesus, I want to follow you. Despite all of the temptations and all of the pulls in the opposite direction, I wanna keep my hand in yours so that we'll walk together. I wanna spend every day that I live in my life in fellowship with you. I have a habit I've done for many years. I wake up in the morning and I say, welcome to my heart, Lord Jesus. Welcome to this place. Come in and make your home in me, like he said he would in John 15. Come and, and make your home so deep within me that I am, I am intimately connected to you. And let me, Lord Jesus, let me be at home in you today. Let this be a new day of experience of walking together and fellowshipping together and a, a day of, of reaffirming in my heart my faith in him. Doesn't mean I get saved all over and over and over again. It just simply means that I reaffirm that fact that I believe in you, Jesus. My trust is in you. If you affirm that in your heart today, I think you can be sure 
that he's got you in his grip and that he will not let you go. And if you will trust him in that way for the rest of your life, then you will not have to worry about the fact of turning away from him because your hand will be so firmly in his that he will hold you fast. Let's pray together. We thank you, Father, for the truth of your word. We thank you for Jesus, our Savior, who is our life. I thank you for touching my life early in my years. Maybe others have that same testimony and experience. But I thank you that you've been faithful all of this time. I pray for everyone here today that there will be a strong a sense of desire to reaffirm our faith in you, to, to hold out our hand and grip tightly onto yours so that we will walk with you in faith and obedience every day, never coming to a point where we would decide ever to want to turn away. Oh, Father, reaffirm that to us, I pray, and keep us strong in you. These are hard days to live, and some of the experiences we go through, Lord, we know may cause us to doubt or to, to weaken, but I pray that you will strengthen us by your inner spirit and allow us to be faithful to you for the rest of our lives. I pray in Jesus' name, God's people can say together, amen.